prayer. And thank you, Jesus, so much for your grace in our lives that we have this opportunity this morning. Uh, we, we look forward to the different things with the, the outreach, with the let's ins, and we lift that before you. And Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we, we desire, God, above all things, for your name to be glorified in those. But this morning, we're asking even for that right now. We want your name to be exalted, to be made much of, to be glorified here this morning in our midst. And as we started our time out, uh, we pray, God, that you will move mightily in our midst by the power of your Holy Spirit. For if you don't do that, we will have gathered in vain. And we, don't, <clears throat> we need to hear from your Holy Spirit, God. We pray for our missionaries, all of them across the globe, particularly Sarah, who's going to be coming back, if not already, back in the United States for a surgery. We lift her up before you and ask that you would be um, working in her eye in such a way that we would bring healing before the surgery. Even That would be awesome. Uh, but prepare her, prepare the, the surgeon. Everybody's going to be involved in that intricate, detailed surgery that you would provide safety for her. And for those that she's leaving behind, in uh, West Africa, we pray that you would provide for their needs in her absence and also for um, the different missionaries that are in the Middle East who are <clears throat> serving in countries where they don't celebrate Jesus or they don't celebrate Christmas. We got an update from Pastor Chris this week and his family is doing it, but in Morocco as a culture doesn't celebrate Christmas like we do and as they have an opportunity now to show the the beauty and wonder of the birth of Christ. I pray that you'd give them favor in that host country as they do that. Um, God, guide us again, even the, the songs that we sing, let our hearts be so in tune with them that we're, we're lost in worship of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I'll invite you to stand as we sing these two songs. <laughs> You doing?
children in the fifth grade on down. You're welcome to go downstairs. There's a teacher and aides down there ready to help you. Uh, the rest of you, if you're staying up here, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. We are near the, the end of Philippians chapter 2. While you're doing that, I just want to say welcome back to Morgan and Connor back there. And uh, there's a friend. It's your name. Yes, welcome. Welcome back. And uh, while we're welcoming them back, we're going to be sending off a few students for a season until when do you guys come back? January? January, the end of January. We'll miss you while you're gone. Yeah, but we do pray that you'll have a great Christmas break in between these semesters. So we're in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to do something. I'm glad this microphone is still here that it didn't drop on the foreign floor and break. Because I'm actually going to come around with a microphone and ask some questions. It's actually just one question, Julia and Jordan. Be ready. <laughs> Here's the question. I'm going to just pose it, get it out there now. And I don't want you to yell it out. I want you to think about it and raise your hand. And you don't have to be in middle school or less. You can actually be any age. But the question I have for you is who do you want to be like when you grow up? Now, maybe some of you who already consider yourself to be grown up, probably debatable, but if you already consider yourself to be grown up, who did you want to be like when you did grow up? So there's my question. Who do you want to be like when you grow up? Anybody? Have anybody they want to be like when they grow up? Uh, hold on. I don't know who Alex Morgan is. And why do you want to be like, is it a he or a she? She. All right. Because she's really, like, really successful and, um, well, I mean, she's like really good and stuff, so. She rocks. She's, she's awesome. So is she on the, like the Olympic team and, yeah, who does she play for? Ooh, all right. Anybody else? Who did you want to be like or who do you want to be like when you grow up? I thought Ross was raising his hand. <laughs> it's just no. Seriously, there's nobody else who has the guts? God, I just speak in this thing? Oh, you do? It would be helpful, <laughs> yes. Um, well, I'm just going to say my co teacher, even though I'm 26, I'm, I don't, I mean, she's been teaching forever and is amazing. So, yeah. Um. I want to be a father and a loving husband. When you grow up. <laughs> there you go. He said just a year or two. Matt, when you grow up, Matt. I always wanted to be a fireman. Why? Did you want to run into the burning buildings? <laughs> Anybody else? Who did you want to be like when you grow up? Did you have that idea, that desire, that, boy, someday when I grow up, I want to be like so and so? Usually as children, we think about these things. We think, oh, man, when I grow up, I want to be just like so and so. I didn't really have too many when I was a child so much, but once, when I got married, that's when I met somebody I wouldn't mind being like when I grow up. I got a picture of him there, and that's me on, on, well, on my left, but the guy on the right is my father-in-law. You know, I just, uh, I'm, it's Christmas, so I'm trying to score points just, just in case he hasn't, <laughs> just in case he hasn't gotten me a gift yet. <laughs> no, but seriously, he's a guy that I I admire and um, think is just incredible. And so someday when I grow up, I want to be like him. And so, yeah. 
The point of this isn't just so that I could suck up to him, though I try to take any opportunity I can to do that. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul is actually going to do for us, he's going to actually show us a couple of people that fit the description that he had just given us. Uh, we looked at it a couple of weeks ago. He said, I want you to have this mind, have a mind like the mind of Jesus Christ. And so then he goes on and changes the subject, but then he comes back to, and he presents for us two people that we would do well to emulate, to say, hey, when I grow up, I want to be like Timothy. When I grow up, I want to be like Epaphroditus. Let's see these two men in action as Paul presents them as two images of people we would do well to be like when we grow up in Christ. I hope, verse 19, in the Lord, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. And listen to what he says about Timothy. Now, Timothy at this point is a young guy. He's not like seasoned. He's a young guy. Paul is considerably older than Timothy. But he says, I have no one like Timothy who would be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. In the meantime, until I can send Timothy though, I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker. He's a fellow soldier. You know him because he's your messenger and minister to me and my needs. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, there nearly to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have, should have sorrow upon sorrow. I, I am eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So, when he comes... Receive him in the Lord with, with joy, with all joy, and honor people like him. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And we remember this passage, it fits in a context, right? It fits in the letter that Paul has written to this church at Philippi. And, and as we think about that, we remember that Paul is where? He's in prison when he writes this letter to them. He is imprisoned in Rome. And by the way this letter reads, in particular this passage, it sounds like he's soon going to hear about his future. Whether or not he's going to be executed, killed for his faith, or released. It seems like, as we read this part of this passage, it sounds like he's going to be getting word about that soon. And so while he's in prison, we know that earlier information in this letter that we've already looked at, that this church, the church of Philippi, has been super great about helping care for Paul's needs. And we remember as we looked at that at the beginning, that the prison system in their day was considerably different than the prison system of our day. And the prison system of their day, when you got sent to prison, you were responsible to care for your own needs. And if you didn't have the means to care for your own needs, you were in trouble. You could have died from starvation or from cold or whatever. But this church had taken it upon themselves to actually care for Paul and to provide for his needs. And the way they did that was by sending this with Epaphroditus, this guy. So they've been caring for him. They've been caring for his needs. And one of the ways is by sending this guy named Epaphroditus. That's the, the, we really don't know a whole lot about this guy other than 
what we just read about him, that he's a, a worker, he's a soldier, he's a brother in Christ, and he came on behalf of that church as their messenger and their, their minister, Paul refers to him. And so they know that they send this guy, Epaphroditus, and we also know that they had to have sent money, a considerable amount of money, to cover all of Epaphroditus' expenses. They would have covered Paul's expenses and, and probably Timothy's as well and who knows who else. But they were generous in caring for Paul while he was in prison. And so Paul says that he hopes to send his protege, uh, the young Timothy, that's, that's his hope, because he can't wait for them to get reunited with Timothy after he learns. He can't do that, though, because he needs Timothy as he re finishes, really, what's going on there. So he learn once he learns his future, then he says, I'll send Timothy, but I'm going to send this guy, e Epaphroditus, I'm going to send him right now. And it's actually likely that Epaphroditus is the one who actually carried the letter that we're reading. You know, it's really cool to think about that this guy, Epaphroditus, actually carried this letter from Paul to the church. And here we are looking at it and studying it, and God is using it to bless his people thousands of years later. But Paul is, he's not just sending any two guys. He's very deliberate in who he's sending to this church. He's very deliberate here in choosing Timothy and Epaphroditus. He's just expressed to him, as I started to say earlier, he's just expressed to them that they have this desire to follow hard after Christ. As, as, as uh, followers of Jesus, our desire is to emulate Christ. Our desire should be uh, not just um, say we're Christians, but to actually walk as Jesus walked. And Paul had just given them a beautiful picture. And so now here he's going to send these two guys that are really excellent examples of what it looks like to live for Christ. Um, today, as followers of Christ, uh, we have that same call, uh, that same call to emulate Christ, to walk as Christ would walk. And I, you know, I could preach on that, and I could bring that idea out, uh, and as I try so many different ways, and I could give you hundreds of illustrations and anecdotes and stories and pictures as to what it looked like today for us, but there's nothing better than to see it actually played out or lived out in front of us. Right? That, that's the way we learn the most is when we actually see somebody living for Christ on a daily basis, walking, and we get to see how they live. And that's why Paul is sending back Timothy and Epaphroditus. He says, I want you to see what it looks like to follow hard after Jesus. That's why I asked, you know, who did you want to be like when you grow up? Well, is there somebody in your faith life, in your journey of following Christ, that you can look at and say, someday when I grow up spiritually, I'd like to look like him or her. As they follow Christ, I'd like to follow them. Really, because in our efforts to be like Jesus, uh, we, we've never, you see, we've never really actually personally walked in the flesh with Jesus. We, we've never done that. We aren't like the disciples and the apostles in the Gospels who actually got to do that. So we don't really know how Jesus would actually handle some of the things that we get confronted with on a daily basis. We don't have the luxury of walking with Jesus, but then again, neither did, did Paul or Timothy or Epaphroditus. We don't know how Christ would have handled cancer. We don't. We don't know how Jesus would have handled, you know, if he were married in or a miscarriage or, or COVID for that matter. We think we got him figured out and we, don't, we know exactly how he'd do it. He'd do this and that, but we don't know. We don't know what he'd do if he lost his job or if his car broke down. <laughs> well, how would Jesus 
do, what would Jesus do? You know, WWJD, what would Jesus do if Jesus lost his job? You know, I don't know, because uh, we didn't get the opportunity to see him live those moments. Or actually any other of, of a thousand experiences that we are going to encounter in our lifetime. So what do we do with that? We know we would have handled it right, but that's not necessarily always helpful to know that he would have just, well, of course, he would have done it perfectly. There's no doubt about that. We may not have the opportunity to literally walk with Jesus, but we can look at others whom we know who do walk with Jesus, who, who appear to be faithful examples of Christ-likeness. Those who are walking as Jesus walked, and, and Paul is sending them to pictures of that. He's sending Timothy and Epaphroditus as pictures of what it looks like to walk with Christ. One commentator says this, this text demonstrates that God does infuse our, into our experience living, breathing replicas of Jesus. Men and women whose heart instincts are growing by grace so that we can sense the heartbeat of Christ in the way they treat others, in the way that they react to adversity, in this, and as we see how and where they invest their energies. Watching them show us what growing up to be like Jesus looks like in the nitty-gritty of everyday life. He goes on to say that for the Philippians, it's going to be Timothy and the messenger Epaphroditus. Each of these two men reflects Jesus to the Philippians and to us. And as they do, their reflections show us what growing up looks like and why and how growing up towards the maturity of Jesus is possible. Paul's implicit motive is to place into the minds of the Philippians and of that congregation men who exemplify Christ. Isn't that great? Paul says that Timothy has been the one who has so beautifully served them. And he so beautifully served me over the long haul. He says that in verse 22, you know how Timothy's proven worth. You, he says, you guys know this about him. Remember that Paul and Timothy are the ones who established this church. There was no church of Philippi. They come in and they start sharing the gospel and living the gospel out before them. And so Timothy has shown them. He says, you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. He says that Timothy is genuinely concerned about the welfare of others. Timothy was with Paul when he planted that church, like we said, and it was, it was likely Timothy's very first experience. He had not had any church planting experience, so he seems to have fallen in love with this church. And, and he saw them repent. He saw people turn from sin and turn towards Jesus Christ and, and make him Lord of their lives. As he, saw, he sees them repenting and turning from sin towards Jesus to make Jesus like Lord. Uh, the more compassion he had for them, wanting to see them experience this beauty and absolute richness. So as he sees them, he just is growing in his heart for them and desires that they would know the richness of the fellowship with Jesus Christ. The wonder and, and the peace and, and hope and joy, all these things that we talk about at Christmas that belong to those who trust in Jesus Christ. And how Timothy was vigorously fighting for them, praying for them on their behalf, that they would gain that posture. He was the guy who would literally give the, the shirt off his back and they wouldn't have had to ask for it. He would have been looking to see. Because, as he says, he is genuinely concerned for your welfare. So I was thinking about this and, and planning this opportunity to share this message. Another such real-life example came to my attention. I prayed for Sarah Wetmore when I prayed. And Sarah is a missionary, that, a nurse in Benin, West Africa. And as a church, we've had the privilege 
of partnering in the gospel. When, when Paul says about Timothy, you, he's a partner in the gospel, well, we've been partnering in the gospel with Sarah for, for over 40 years. And you, some, many of you have actually met her because she stood here and shared different parts of her journey, different parts of her story with us. Well, about two weeks ago, she emailed us with a prayer request. And she said that she had suffered, and we don't know how it happened, but she had suffered from a detached retina and can't see in that eye. And it's, it requires her to come back to the United States. Now, what you don't know, many of you don't know this, some if you follow closely will, that she's only literally months away from retirement. She has been serving the Lord so faithfully, but she's in a, almost in a mandatory, she's aged out of serving in this particular mission field. So she's, she's not quitting. She's going to move back to Sebring, Florida, and there is a home there for retired missionaries where she could go and she could sit in a lounge chair and kick her feet up, but she's not going to. She's a nurse, and she's going to go there and serve in that place. She's months from that. But then this happens. This detached retina thing happens, and listen to what she asked us to pray for and see if you don't hear that picture of Timothy here. Pray for safe travel and successful surgery, quick healing, and the Lord's provision for the care of the AIDS patient in the Alafia Clinic during my absence. And pray for a swift and safe return to Benin for my last few months of missionary service before I have to retire. I mean, that's what's when Paul says about Timothy, I have no one like him who is so genuinely concerned for your welfare, that's what the, Jim Williams, who's a, a part of our missions committee, and when he, he received this email first and sent it out to the rest, and, and he said this in the email that he wrote, he said, it's so characteristic of Sarah that she worry mainly about the impact of her absence on her current ministry there I think I have a picture of Sarah, don't I? I think that's the next picture. Yeah, that's her. You remember her? He said it's so characteristic of Sarah that she would worry mainly about the impact of her absence from her current ministry there when she has a health emergency requiring her to come back to the United States and that she seeks not to stay in the U.S. but to return to AIDS ministry even though she has to retire in just three months from the time that she'll get back there. That's just one example. Thanks, uh, Caesar. That's just one example of what it looks like, though, right? We see that, and okay, now I get an idea of what Paul means when he says, I want you to have an image. Uh, I want to put before you somebody who genuinely is concerned about your welfare so that you can see Timothy, so that you can see Epaphroditus, so you can see Sarah and know what it looks like in the nitty-gritty of everyday life when you do get those diagnoses, or when that car does break down, or whatever happens, you get to see when you get an emergency medical crisis, what does it look like? This doesn't come, you know, Sarah's desire, you know, that's not in the job description, is a missionary, like, okay, if you have a medical emergency, you know, this is the protocol. This comes from it's, it's not a, a personality trait either. It, it really comes from a, a posture that's born out of a, a heart that has been apprehended by the gospel of Jesus Christ, who has seen these people who have been diseased with AIDS come to the clinic, and she's had opportunity to get to know them and love them and share Jesus with them. And those people are coming, and they are hearing and being apprehended by the love of Jesus Christ. They are hearing about Christ, and they... Just uh, so Sarah's falling in love with them, and that's what that's born out of a heart that's been consumed by grace, a heart that's been consumed by mercy, a heart, her heart's been consumed by the compassion that God has shown her. That's the, the starting point that God, she says, has shown me compassion. Well, how could I not be compassionate towards others? And this is just an example of what it looks like when Paul says, I have no one else like Sarah hmm. or Timothy or Epaphroditus or Tom Riley who genuinely cares about your welfare 
All the others care only for themselves, not for what matters to Jesus Christ. Timothy here has proven that he has the things of Christ, and he didn't do it because he set out to try and impress Paul. He did it because he's a recipient of the grace and mercy and compassion of God. And so as a result of that, he's, he's moving away from having to be consumed with the things of earth, the troubles of life, the, the trappings of living that impede us from serving the things of Christ. It's likely that this was uh, how Timothy served with Paul in preaching the good news. I mean it this way. There's no escaping that one of the, the, the biggest transformations that happens in Christ followers is, is gaining a heart of compassion towards others. This is with, without question, in, in my opinion, the heart that most reflects Christ's own heart. And we preach Christ and his gospel best with our lives reflecting his heart of compassion. And so when Paul says, he has served with me in proclaiming the good news, think that's exactly how he did it, by caring compassionately for that church. And he's looking at Jesus' compassionate heart towards him and and he's learning about Jesus' compassionate heart about others. And I have some verses here that I want to share. Look at Matthew chapter 9. You don't have to go there. I got them up here for you. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says about Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because in his eyes they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he sees them and he takes compassion on them because that's who Jesus is. And then he says to his disciples, he's turning his attention now away from the crowds and to the disciples, he says, I want you to, to have this kind of compassion that, that you see what I have. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. Would you pray that God would send workers into the harvest? And of course, the implication that they'd have to infer from that is like he's asking me to pray whether or not I will go whether or not I would have that kind of heart of compassion that he has. He's challenging me, do, do you have that? Or Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, as soon as Jesus heard the news and somebody had come to him with bad news, he left the boat to a remote area to be alone, uh, but the crowds heard that he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd. You know, he's tired. And you've been doing this all day, all week, all month, and you know that feeling like, you know what? I'm spent, I'm tired, I'm going someplace, I'm going to an Airbnb. <laughs> I'm just going to go be alone. And he sees this crowd of people following him, and he's, instead of calling Uber, he sees the huge crowd, and as he steps from the boat, he has compassion on them and healed their sick. Or Matthew chapter 15, then Jesus calls his disciples and says to them, I have compassion for these people. It's another large crowd, 5,000 people. They've been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. And he asked the disciples in one of the gospels, what do you want to do about this? And they said, like, send them away. There's stores, there's an Aldi's, there's a Wegmans, there's a Walmart. I don't want to send them away hungry or they'll faint along the way. It was just compassionate. It was instinctive. In chapter 20 of Matthew, as Jesus, you start to see this picture that Matthew's gospel is trying to pour, paint a picture for us that God has moved out of compassion towards us and that Jesus is a compassionate Savior. As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large, another large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. And when they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Son of David, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And what does the crowd tell him to do? Shut up. You're annoying. Be quiet. Don't you see somebody important here? But they only shouted louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, he said, shut up, can't you see I'm important? No. Listen to what he says to them, what he says to us. He stopped and called, what, do you want? what can I do for you? 
What can I do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see. And Jesus, having compassion for them, touched their eyes, and instantly they could see. And then one last one in Mark chapter 1. A man with leprosy. Might as well have been a death sentence in that day. He comes and he kneels before Jesus, begging to be healed. And if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he says to Jesus. And there again, moved with compassion. Jesus reaches out and touched him and says, I am willing. He's compassionate. He's modeling for us. This is what it looks like to be a follower. This is what it looks like to trust, believe, follow. And so not only did Paul and sending Timothy and Epaphroditus display Christ-likeness, that's what they're doing. Paul is sending these two images he sends them Epaphroditus. Now, we've been looking at Timothy, but we could have just totally spent our time looking at Epaphroditus. We don't know, you know, we get all kinds of information about Timothy, but we get a few verses about Epaphroditus. But what do we, what do we hear about him? Paul refers to him as, as my brother. Some translations actually say my true brother. This is, he wants, you know, the church at Philippi to understand here is a guy who sincerely desires to know and follow Christ deeply. Look to him as you learn to how to do that. Look to him. He calls him, he says, not only my true brother, but he says he's a fellow worker. He's a fellow worker, one who labors with me, one who has been, you sent him, and he has ministered to me. He's working on your behalf. He said he's filling up in, in me what you couldn't do. I know you'd love to have all come to see me, but that wouldn't have been very practical. So you said, you know what? Let's send our best, the one who is who's just so compassionate and such a good minister will send Epaphroditus to Paul. And that's exactly what he's done. And Paul says, he's not only done it with you, he's done it with me. And he says, I also look to him and I look at this Epaphroditus and Paul says, I look at him like he's one of a fellow soldier." one who's suffering with me, one who's going into battle arm in arm for the gospel. And I don't know what Paul would have seen in Epaphroditus, that that's how he would have defined him. But it just challenges, Paul says, he just challenges me to be a better Christ follower. You imagine, you know, we, we exalt Paul like he's up on some pedestal, but here he is, He's exalting Timothy and he's exalting Epaphroditus and saying he's a messenger of God to me. He's, a, he's like a minister of the gospel to me. He's ministering to me. You guys, as a church, when I send him back to you, I want you to like, receive him with joy. And don't just receive him with joy and throw him a ticker tape parade because he's done a good job. Live like that. Live like that. He's given us these two images of what it looks like to walk out our faith. Timothy and Epaphroditus. I've given us, I think, two as well in Sarah or Tom. I don't, or I do think it's worth noting also quickly. There's some, there's, there's kind of helpful to have a contrast, right? What's the opposite of what it might look like as well? What is, let's see. Timothy or Epaphrodites, you know, we take up this collection because a friend of ours, a, a dear brother in Christ or sister in Christ, is really struggling somewhere. And we take up a collection and, and we want someone to deliver it and go there and care for them. We send them there with the purpose of, of bringing the aroma of Christ to be an encouragement to them, to lift them up. And they get there, and this is the report we hear back instead. What if we got the report back that the posture that they took when they got there is how, Paul, I need you to care for me while I'm here. Like somehow that posture, the opposite of what it would look like to only have the interests of others in mind would be to, that somehow we have the right to be served. Somehow we have the right, whether it's because of our age. Some people think that because we're older, Younger people should serve us. Or because we've walked with Jesus longer, we should maybe have 
more prestigious positions. Or maybe it's because of our status. Don't you know who I am? And I had somebody say that to me once here in this church. I was so... I can't even think of an expression. I was so saddened for that person because this person did hold a pretty high position. The problem was that they held that same high position of themselves in their own head. And they were upset that when they turned around to have a conversation with somebody else in the church, that that person didn't know who they were. Not that they didn't know his name. It's just that they didn't know who he was. And that offended that guy. And I, I was just so saddened for this seasoned Christian that that was the approach that he had. Sometimes we feel that way, like people should serve us. And that's, that's as far from Christ-likeness as you can possibly get. If the four, first portrait we would call arrogance, then maybe the second would be indifference. Imagine if the report we heard back from Epaphroditus or the report that we hear back from Sarah, she's coming back as a missionary from Benin, West Africa, and she's like, I don't really care what happens while I'm gone. I don't really care what happens to those people. Imagine if we heard from Paul that Epaphroditus had gone there and he was just totally indifferent about Paul or totally indifferent about the church that sent him. You know, you've heard this saying that the opposite of love actually is not hate. We think that. But the worse than love, not, not worse than hate, is indifference. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. I've heard the expression another way that the worst form of cruelty is indifference. The church, this church, wasn't indifferent towards Paul's situation. They didn't just say, wow, you know, that stinks, Paul, I'll, I'll pray for you, and then go about their day. Indifference isn't something you do, it's something you don't do, right? It's when you don't care. It's an attitude that says, you don't mean enough to me for me to give you my time, my energy, my money, and to somehow care enough to meet your needs. It means I, I, I want you to meet my needs, but I don't want to give back or expend myself or sacrifice myself to meet your needs. The opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. Indifference says how you feel or what you want doesn't matter to me at all. Indifference says that you're, you're really just not even a person for me to love, but an object to use. Indifference says I, I don't need to change anything to make our relationship better. It's okay to just stay the way I am. Indifference says that you exist for my benefit. And when you don't please me or benefit me anymore, you're totally replaceable or disposable. Could you imagine if Paul had written that back to the church about Epaphroditus? Or what about the... He seemed like he only wanted to come and visit me because of who I was, that he could somehow leverage that relationship for personal gain. You know, like... We do these things. We treat people like they're, you know, we leverage power brokers. We leverage their wealth, their, their attractiveness, their intelligence or charisma or, or sheer self-confidence to somehow gather a circle of uh, devotees to, for our own purposes. Using people is the opposite of caring for them. And so Paul is like, I want you to see Epaphroditus. I want you to see Timothy. You've heard it said in the world that there are, what, two kinds of people. And then, you know, there's all kinds of things. But often it's said there's two kinds of people in the world. There are givers and there are takers. Here's the point Paul is making. We reflect Christ best by being givers. 
We reflect Christ best by serving one another, by being givers. For sure, there's no better image of compassion, no, no greater example of a giver than God himself. And that's, you know, when we, the season of Christmas, we, we celebrate today this, this, this whole season. It only exists because of the compassionate goodness of God. Right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. My deepest wish for you is that you would receive this compassionate love of Jesus who, who died on the cross to set you free from sin. That you would confess your need for him, that you would turn to him in faith and making this really the greatest Christmas ever. Not just be more like Timothy. You know, that, could, that would be a suitable conclusion. Be more like Epaphroditus. Be more like Sarah or Tom or you name it. But that's not the point. The point is come to Christ Come to Jesus and let him transform you into his likeness. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we confess that we all need Christ. And that we don't develop a list of do's and don'ts to make ourselves better or good. What we do is we bow before you and say, here's my heart, Lord. Take it and give, give me a new heart. Give me your heart, a heart of compassion. As you have been compassionate, to me. Enable me to be compassionate to others. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and